Last time we uh, got into Canto 10, and I began with the heaven of the sun, and I began with uh, the description of, uh, of Dante begins. We went over the phases of the canto. Uh, on the one hand, the, this disc description of the Trinity, of the inner life of the Trinity, as a life of love, uh, the breath, and, and the Father, the um, love, the Son, the, sp the Father, uh, bound by the breath of love, uh, as it were. And then Dante moves on to um, it's the, a description of the spectacle of, uh, of the whole, uh, this heaven and of this, part, this fragment of the cosmos by turning to us readers twice, asking us to look up. Uh, it is that it, by looking up, we can see uh, the givenness of creation. The fact that it has been given, uh, it's, it's a gift to us. Uh, it's also a way of, uh, if, it's, if it's a gift, um, if there's an economy, a theo-economy in the cosmos, it's a, a, a divine economy, it also means that somehow, somehow we cannot really claim to to own it, that, that it seems to be a, a natural consequence of uh, something being a gift does not imply, does not entail necessarily ownership of uh, this gift. It has been given and therefore we, we are invited to have an aesthetic uh, uh, admiration uh, of it. Uh, so this, this kind of this scene of uh, of, of the divine, this, even a kind of theodrama, divine drama, a spectacle that unfolds, uh, ends, uh, unfolds uh, throughout the cosmos, ends with a description of uh, the encyclopedia as, uh, as I was describing it to you. Uh, that is to say, with Aquinas who recounts uh, the names and mentions one after the other, uh, the 12 um, representatives of various uh, disciplines. We talked a little bit about uh, Solomon and uh, the scandal that his inclusion here uh, caused, caused at, at, at Dante's own times, since it, it, Dante is responding to a real crisis about our knowledge of uh, the ultimate fate of Solomon, the wisest of all men, uh, was he saved or not? Uh, on account of his weaknesses in terms of his, uh, his, uh, well, his lechery. Um, and then uh, the canto focuses on, uh, ends really, with uh, uh, Seger of Brabant, who was a logician, a philosopher, and Dante describes him uh, really on the way to, to knowledge. He was a heretic, he was viewed of as, a, as, as a heretic, Dante, uh, dismisses that whole charge, and in many ways he represents it for knowledge as, or the circle of knowledge as one of, made of uh, contradictory voices, where those who had been blaming Seger of Brabant, such as Aquinas himself, now retract their positions. So the whole process of getting to know the world is one of errors and it's one of retractions, okay? Uh, there are some interesting details that I could, uh, I could uh, even, I think that I should even mention to you uh, as, uh, as we approach 11 and 12. Uh, uh, Seger is described as he's uh, absorbed in his grave thoughts. In Italian is uh, a gravi pensieri, you know, the word pensiero is a, uh, in English pens pensive. Uh, and, and I think that that is such a remarkable uh, word because it really means to think in Latin uh, and they always exploit this resonance of the verb means to be, to, to be at an impasse, to be suspended, literally, to be suspended. So he's suspended in thoughts as if the thoughts could not quite make him reach uh, the threshold of uh, the knowledge he, uh, he wanted. At any rate, that's the way uh, Canto 10, that's the economy of Canto 10. I want to, uh, since there are three cantos that go together, to really, I, I ask you to turn to the end of Canto 12, 
where uh, Bonaventure, who is a Franciscan, uh, you probably know what, what is meant by that. The Franciscan is one in the order of St. Francis, just as Aquinas is Dominican. The Franciscans are those who believe in the priority of will and love in the act of knowledge. Uh, the Dominicans or Neo-Aristotelians like Aquinas believe in the priority of the intellect in the apprehension of the world. The Dominicans were founded with the explicit um, mandate to teach in the universities where heresies, they thought, abounded and therefore they had to extirpate, pluck off the roots of heresies. The Franciscans were going to be uh, witnessing in the world uh, and both orders are uh, shaped by a belief in poverty that we have to examine a little bit. We have to understand what, what it means. At any rate, uh, Bonaventure is a Franciscan and by the end of Canto 12, after he has been uh, uh, chronicling the life of uh, uh, Dominic, uh, this is sort of another case of extraordinary openness of uh, in Dante's view of these characters in the sense that Franciscans and Dominicans were really at odds with each other, both in terms of their theologies and their, and their premises, uh, more intellectual premises above all. Here, Dante has a Franciscan tell the life of Dominic, just as earlier in Canto 11, a Dominican Aquinas tells the life of Francis. The two cantos are controlled by what we call a chiasmus. That's, that's, this is a chiasmus from the, the Greek word chi, uh, he, uh, a chiasmus, right? Uh, so you have uh, an intersection of, uh, of voices, a sort of a sense of the interdependence of the two perspectives. Um, I will say a little bit more about Bonaventure after I read this paragraph. This paragraph here, the last paragraph in Canto 12, lines 130 and following, uh, uh, sort of functions as a counterweight to the description of the encyclopedia that Aquinas had given at the end of Canto 10 and ending with uh, Seizure of Brabant. So let me just see who the people are here. I'm the living soul of Bonaventure of Bagnorea, who in great offices ever put last the left hand care. Here are Illuminato and Augustine, who were among the first barefoot poor brothers uh, that in the, in the code made themselves God's friends. Then a theorist of medieval encyclopedias, Hugh of St. Some Vic, some Victor, uh, a Parisian uh, friar um, who really wrote the so-called Didascalicon, which is a text about what, is the, what, are, what are the stages of education? How does the mind come to the knowledge of God, starting from the, the small uh, elements in the outside life, the material world, then the interior lights, etc., before reaching the God's supreme light. Then uh, is here with them Peter the bookworm, Peter the Spaniard, another theorist of uh, medieval logic who shines below in 12 books. Then Nathan the prophet, I'll come back to his name, the prophet Nathan. He is uh, known to, to those who know. Uh, as being uh, David's uh, bad conscience or good conscience, the one who is pricking him to think about himself. Nathan, uh, the prophet, uh, censor, counselor of the king. A little bit more about him in a while. And Chrysostom, the metropolitan, meaning the guy with the golden mouth, language, here is the, the flower of eloquence is what he possesses. Um, and Anselm, the, another theologian who writes about the reasons for the incarnations, right? F famous texts is about why, uh, do, why did God become a man? And then Donatus who deigned to set his hand to the first art, grammar. So you see you have the whole array, the whole wide spectrum of what we call the encyclopedia, logic, eloquence, um, uh, grammar, Donatus is the, a, a Roman grammarian, and then Rabanus, a historian, and beside me shines the Calabrian abbot Joachim, who was endowed with a spirit of prophecy. The glowing uh, 
courtesy and well judged language of Brother Thomas have moved me to celebrate so great a paladin and with me have moved this uh, company. Uh, Bonaventure ends with uh, uh, the tip of the hat in the direction of uh, Aquinas, whose example he has followed. So an example of, uh, once again, of a dialogue and openness between the two orders and the two, um, the two members of different orders and yet in somehow interdependent with each other. Uh, now, uh, the presence of Abbot Joachim is another counterweight to seizure of Brabant in Canto 10. He too, Joachim, uh, whom you have met because I, I sort of mentioned his name to you in discussing the prophecy, glossing the prophecy of the DXV in Purgatorio 33. You remember where I tried to explain it that uh, there seems to be a kind of apocalyptic meaning to that prophecy, the numerical enigma, uh, an enigmatic prophecy about the coming of uh, uh, Christ at the end of time who will come and therefore um, the, the prophecy of the consummation of history and the consummation of time, the DXV, the 500, 10 and 5, as that is called. And I said that the, the, um, the, 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 the joachistic interpretation of that emblem, of that symbol, uh, seemed to me to be accurate. It really meant, it really sort of introduces the idea of uh, the end of time. However, I rejected, I ask you to also reject the implications of that prophecy, the uh, Joachistic prophecy, it was viewed as heretical for a number of important reasons. It, it expresses a sort of impatience about history. It, that is to say, it really believes, first of all, in the uh, imminent end closure of history. His, the, the end is close at hand. Uh, and this is a kind of, and, and, the, and the end of history implies the um, uh, the coming into being of uh, a utopia, a utopia of the spirit, the third age of the spirit, when finally all institutions, all barriers are shattered and torn down. And this is a kind of, this is really what, what from Dante's point of view would be wrong with uh, a joachistic utopian impulse. The idea that it always begs a foreclosure of what we can never really fathom, which is the world of uh, uh, historical occurrences. But another reason why he was viewed as heretical by exactly Bonaventure, it was Bonaventure who asked that his views be damned and now he is sort of uh, writing a palinode. Dante allows him to make amends for the previous condemnation. Bonaventure found objectionable the ideas of uh, Joachim of Flora because Joachim de facto is dissolving the whole notion of the unity of the Trinitarian life. He, he, he theorizes a, an idea of history, a tripartite idea of history, according to the three uh, persons of the Trinity, the age of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He believes that there, is once, there was once in biblical times there was the age of the Father. God was understood as the Father. Then we entered the age of, uh, of the Son, uh, brotherhood of all, and now the spiritual age of the Holy Spirit. It de facto really means that the three uh, ways, the three manifestations, this kind of complex way of understanding a unity from different viewpoints is actually um, uh, uh, dissolved. It's, it's become separate. Each, uh, each person of the Trinity becomes a separate entity. And that view from, for, for Bonaventure was uh, uh, heretical. He condemns him. Now he acknowledges that he actually was Abbot Joachim who was endowed with a spiritual prophecy. There's something only prophetic. In other words, what seemed to be heresy, an uh, intellectual question of, uh, of, of, um, of thoughts and opinions now appears as some divination about uh, uh, things to come, uh, not, 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 not specified any further. Retrospectively, it's Dante himself who is legitimizing Joachim and therefore also legitimizing his own position in Canto 33 uh, of Purgatorio. Dante shares the view of the apocalyptic denouement of history. However, uh, he refuses, he rejects the idea that it's possible to establish uh, 
uh, a, a date for such a, an occurrence. Joachim appears now as a, a visionary among, among them. The other figure that I would like to say something about is Nathan the prophet for a very simple reason. Because Nathan, as you probably know, because it's very strange, why would Dante include Nathan, a prophet, among, okay, there's Joachim of Flora who is prophetic, uh, but why include Nathan among these uh, wise spirits? I mean, he could have chosen so many others. He would have chosen uh, uh, those who actually have written and whose, whose, whose works are canonical in the Bible. He doesn't. Uh, he chooses Nathan, and the idea is, I think, a little bit of uh, a, a, an autobiographical uh, a pun about Dante himself. Because the Na Nathan, the word Nathan means he who gives. In other words, Dante saw in the name of Nathan his own name. And he places him there. That's what Dante means, he who gives. Nathan becomes a kind of mask for Dante himself. It is as if he were saying, had I, if I had I another life uh, or a posthumous life uh, in uh, the heavenly apotheosis, that's where I probably would like, that's where I, I probably will end up. Certainly that's where I would like to be. So in Nathan there is a mask for himself. Now, why, um, uh, what is this so, uh, so peculiar about uh, this uh, encyclopedic ordering of the arts and the sciences. It doesn't really uh, differ very much from Aquinas, but it's interesting that it's Bonaventure who, who, who uh, articulates, who voices this kind of, uh, who celebrates all these names and all these arts. Because Bonaventure is himself a, a theorist of the encyclopedia, very much as Hugh of St. Victor, but he has one crucial reflection at the beginning of his encyclopedia, is that the activity of knowing and learning is like going up and down a ladder. And you might say, you read that metaphor, you might say, well, that's an extraordinary metaphor, but it's the metaphor of the ladder of Jacob in the Bible, which is where he probably found it, the ladder of Plato. You know, that's where the, this idea that uh, we ascend, the mind ascends when we learn something, when we, we get educated. The mind goes up and it actually can go down. But the interesting thing about Bonaventure is that he goes on saying that as in a ladder, the lowest rung are always more important than the higher ones. Because without those, no one of us would be capable to climb up the ladder. So the lowest, the lowly uh, forms of knowledge, grammar, uh, the, 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 the external lights, of the senses, because he distinguishes his is a, a theory of knowledge as, uh, as a proliferation of lights, as a universe of lights, internal, external lights, internal lights, the lights of the senses, uh, the lights that come to us from books and the light of God and so on. So we are always going to be enlightened in our process. But as we are enlightened, the lowest lights are, first of all, self-sufficient. They are those who may not be capable of ascending much higher. Uh, in, uh, in the, in along the ladder uh, than the first few rungs. That is already a self-sufficient knowledge that they can acquire. Uh, so the arts of, to him, the arts of poetry, that's the lowest rung, and yet that has its own self-sufficiency. And then you can go up the ladder and, in, in, and really learn more. But the, the interesting thing about the ladder is that there is no sense, though it establishes a hierarchy, in that hierarchy, the lower elements are as crucial as the higher elements. Because without the lower, the, the lower rungs, you really can never really uh, uh, can go up uh, to the end. The so uh, this is uh, another image. Then for the, the finally, uh, let me just say with uh, uh, with the Joachim, uh, uh, the inclusion of Joachim. Uh, here we are getting into the. Uh, the erasure of uh, uh, strict barriers, strict uh, boundaries between uh, what is heretical and what is, uh, what is canonical. I think this is a sort of, of openness, uh, Dante's openness, uh, that somehow reverberates with uh, the lesson of Francis and Dominic. And therefore now, let me turn to those two cantos. Keep in mind then, uh, as we read Canto 11, we are again 
um, I, I, uh, I repeat, in the heaven of the sun. And I don't know that uh, the passage that I read to you from the Pseudo Dionysius last time about the divine names, where uh, the Pseudo Dionysius goes on talking about uh, 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 why is the metaphor of the sun such a, such, such a, such a fundamental image for the divine, uh, divine generosity, right? This is uh, as, as a, an image of uh, uh, the sun that always gives of itself without ever asking anything, anything back. So it's, a, it's an activity of uh, purely genero pure generosity. Um, and I think that's a Franciscan image of uh, also of poverty to which I will, uh, but which I'll talk in a moment. The Canto 11, I repeat, ends with uh, the extraordinary um, uh, encomium of Seger of Brabant. By a counterpoint, Canto 11 uh, has an apostrophe against uh, logical, legal uh, forms of knowledge, the kind of knowledge that tries to define the world in formulas. And so Dante begins, and this is Dante speaking on his own, in his own voice, O oh, insensate care of mortals, how vain are the reasonings that make thee beat thy wings in downward flight. One was going after law, another after the aphorisms, one following the priesthood, and another seeking to rule by force or craft, one set on robbery and another on affairs of state, one laboring in the toils of fleshly delights, and another given up to idleness, while I, set free from all these things, was high in heaven with Beatrice received, uh, received thus uh, uh, gloriously. I think it's an interesting uh, counterpoint between these icons of power uh, that derive from the study of law and logic, and then, the, on the other hand, this uh, uh, Dante's own self-reference to himself as free from all of this, uh, these concerns. I think this idea of freedom will be the dominant theme of, uh, of, Canto, of Canto 11. Who, uh, it continues, and when each had come back to the point of the circle where it was before, there are the two wheels of dancing old men holding their hands around the sun, as a, which is a metaphorical sun, so that uh, the universe is not even, is, is, is not heliocentric, Dante's universe, they're going to move now beyond the sun. It stopped like a candle on its stand, and then there is a little prayer here, and uh, uh, the, the introduction of uh, the two, Dominic and Francis, lines 30 and following, the providence that rules the world with that counsel in which every created sight is vanquished before it reaches the bottom, in order that the bride of him who with loud cries wedded her with his sacred blood should go to her, beloved, secure in herself and faithful, faithfuler to him, ordained for her, be for her behoof, two princes to be her guides on this side and that. The one uh, was all seraphic, in order, and that's Francis. The other, for wisdom, was on earth a splendor of cherubic light. I shall tell of the one, since to praise one, whichever we take, is to speak of both, for the laborers were to one end. That's really the, the formula that, that uh, seals the sense of uh, the interdependence of intellect and will, uh, of love and knowledge, and of the two the two voices. And now this is the, what we call a hagiography or a legend, the life of a saint, a saint's life of uh, Francis, which is told by, uh, by, by Aquinas, by the Dominican Aquinas. Um, what we are told is, first of all, between the topino and the water that falls from the hill chosen by the blessed Ubaldo hangs a fertile slope of the lofty mountain from which Perugia feels cold and heat at Porta Sole, and behind it, Nocere and Gualdo grieve under a heavy yoke. It's an extraordinarily localized representation of Francis' origin. It's a topography. He was born, as you know, in Assisi, but it's almost as if he were just placing him in a specific place, near the gate that leads uh, that, uh, on the road uh, to Perugia. So Assisi and Perugia, very precise. Uh, and it's called Porta Sole. More about this in a moment. From this slope, where it most breaks its steepness, a sun. Now we go from the toponymic, the name of a place, the gate of the sun, 
Sun Gate is the Gate of the Sun to a metaphor for Francis as the Sun. He is the Sun. So we are in the heaven of the Sun, and now Dante invests Francis with all the attributes of this solarity, this continuous, steady giving of oneself as the sun does in the Neoplatonic imagery, the mystical Neoplatonic imagery of, uh, of the pseudo Dionysus. A sun rose on the world as this does sometimes from the Ganges. Um, uh, he, so as soon as we, Dante has mentioned the specific place for Francis' birth, then the coordinates of uh, the geographic coordinates completely change. We go from the specific and local to literally the global, the world of the Ganges, the Orient, something a little vaster. As if the sun, Francis, really acts between the concrete and local and, and, and the widest uh, uh, possible uh, reference. Um, therefore, let, let him who makes mention to that place not say ascesi, which means I, I rise, but it's punning with Assisi, for he would say too little, but Orient, if he would name it rightly. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's an extraordinary image, and two astronomical terms, the sun and the Orient, uh, for, for Francis. Because Francis appears, as, not just as the sun does, as one who can, and I'm, I'm playing with uh, the text here a little bit, but not much, one who orients us, one who is supposed to orient and reorient us. He's born in, the, in, in Assisi and yet this appears as if it were the East. What, what, he's, what Dante is implying, I think, is that, that for those who go on the face of the earth and lose their ways, then Francis becomes one who can tell them how to find their way back, wherever they are going. Uh, for those who do not know their way at all, have known, never known the way, they are capable of discovering it. He is providing this light. So what is this light that he provides? What kind of light does he uh, bring out? He was not yet far from his rising, uh, the metaphorics of the sun continues, when he began to make the earth feel some strengthening from his mighty influence for, and now he gives the story of Francis life. Um, and before I go there, I, I just want to tell you that Dante, and I brought a, a translation of a poem, Dante, that uh, Dante knew uh, that Francis is, an extra, is, is a great poet. He's actually, we consider him the first poet of, uh, in Italian, in the Italian language. I just want to read a few uh, uh, stanzas from the so-called Canticle of Brother Son so that you can see how uh, Dante's own metaphorics derive straight out of this Franciscan uh, vision, Franciscan uh, spirituality. He begins, most high, it's a prayer, a canticle of brother son. Uh, all powerful good Lord, yours are the praises, the glory, the honor, and all blessing. To you alone, most high, do they belong, and no man is worthy to mention your name. Praised be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Brother Son, who is, the who is the day and through whom you give us light, and is beautiful and radiant with great splendor, and bears a likeness of you, most high one. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister moon and the stars. In heaven you form them clear and precious and beautiful. Praised be you, my Lord, through Brother Wind, goes through all the four elements, and part of the the suggestiveness of this poem is that uh, it's a song of praise to God, clearly enough, but it is also, we never know if, uh, if uh, Francis is thinking of these elements, the sun, the moon, the wind, the water, death uh, itself, as the medium through whom he can praise, or the cause on account of which he should praise, or they are the agents. Uh, the Italian is very ambiguous, poor. Uh, for those of you who may know a little French or a little Spanish, uh, for, by, through, uh, this is so, there's a kind of extraordinary choir and orchestration. The other thing that I should mention is that finally we can understand the rhetoric of praise that is running through this poem, but it, we also saw 
as uh, descri the, 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 uh, describing the rhetoric of praise in Dante's Vita Nuova, when he finds out that the best way of writing about Beatrice is really to write uh, 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 praise poems, not actually which he distinguishes from flattery, but praise po poems, the poems of praise means in many ways rejecting all sense of ownership, realizing that not uh, the fact that one may know the world doesn't mean that one owns it, and also it, it means that not knowing Beatrice is not just a cover to wish to own her. So the praise is as disinterested and as free a mode of uh, acknowledgement of Beatrice herself. Let's see how this continues, this whole uh, uh, poetic vision of Francis continues with, uh, with uh, Canto 11. Dante goes on giving us the life of Francis. And he catches Fra Francis in what is, in what I would call, using the language of anthropology really, a liminal stage. You, you know what I mean by the liminal stage. The word <coughs> liminal comes from, it's, it's a, the Latin uh, threshold, or comes from the Latin for uh, limit. There are two words, many ways, very contradictory, but it, it, it has the power, uh, limen uh, uh, is one thing meaning meaning threshold, but also the word uh, may also be limit. Uh, so the threshold may be a limit, and the threshold may also be an opportunity to cross, a way of going over. I call it, Dante doesn't use here, he just does use the word limit uh, several times, not in this context. Dante places uh, Francis in a liminal position. That is, uh, that is to say, between and between two different orders. On the one hand, the world, and on the other hand, some kind of uh, utopian idea that we never, we never, which would be the order that he goes on to institute, or some uh, general vision about what the world ought to be. He places uh, Francis in between, uh, neither part of the world nor part of this final utopia. And let's see what he does in this liminal position. Uh, that's where he catches him. And look at these lines here. Um, still a youth. Uh, this is the biography of, of Francis, uh, modeled on a number of uh, biographies that were ex existed uh, at, uh, at the time. Um, uh, for still a youth, he ran into strife with his father, for a lady to whom as to death none willingly unlocks the door, which is an extraordinarily difficult line to translate. The Italian really could be read to say unlocks the door of pleasure. Um, and before his spiritual court, and now he uses a, a Latin phrase, which is a legal formula, and has the value of a legal formula, coram patre, that is to say he marries this woman, we don't know who she is yet, in the presence of his own father, thus giving legitimacy to his, um, his act, the act of marriage. Um, uh, Coram Patri, he was joined to her and thenceforth loved her better every day. She, bereft of her first husband, Christ, despised and obscure 1100 years and more, remained without a suitor till he came. Not did it avail when men heard that he was he who put all the world in fear, found her unmoved with Amiclas at the sound of his voice. Nor did it avail her to have such courage and constancy that where Mary stayed below, she mounted the cross with Christ. But lest I proceed too darkly, taking up Francis and poverty for these lovers, in all I have said, their harmony and happy looks moved men to love and wonder and sweet contemplation and led, the, and led them to holy thoughts so that the venerable Bernard first went barefoot and ran after the great peace and running through himself too slow. All wealth unknown and fruitful good. So you, uh, there is clearly a reversal. Uh, Francis marries poverty and yet out of that marriage to poverty, we have to understand what in a moment what that is. A lot of wealth, a lot of riches uh, can be produced, a clear um, a clear turning of uh, uh, whatever intentions he may have had uh, and, and uh, the, the consequences of that act of his. What is this representation of Francis? Um, it's, I think, in this liminal position, Francis is shown as he is turning upside down all 
the values that the world holds dear. So um, he wants to marry nothing, right? Poverty, to marry poverty is to marry nothing. You marry to be, you want to, you yoke yourself, you embrace owning nothing. But that marriage or that union appears as a sacramental act. So he's making fun. He's parodying better. Just let me be a bit, bit more, because I don't want to, uh, to imply at all any blasphemy here, but he's parodying even the sacrament of marriage. He's marrying nothing. He's it's not a legal person, uh, some, some agent poverty. It's, it's just an idealization or an allegory for nothing. But that is conducted, that ceremony is conducted as if it were a sacramental act. Not only a sacramental act, he's parodying the law because he's marrying poverty in the presence of his own father. He undress, he divests himself of all the clothes, which in the Middle Ages, as much as now, always stand for some form of uh, symbolic status. The way you, you, know, you dress according to the job you want, they usually say, right? But, to say, but what I mean to, to, to say is that dresses, clothes, are part of a social set of values, which Francis is flouting and parodying. We, have, we are in the, in the presence of the parody of uh, legal language, sacramental language, even the language of love. At one point, the language of sexuality, the idea of marrying poverty to who, to who does not, I changed the, 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 the translation of the phrase the way St. Clair, because it's a little bit uh, torturous, even in Italian, the way St. Clair uh, uh, has it, uh, he says, none willingly unlocks the door. That unwillingly is the door of pleasure. Even sexuality, which is a va certainly a value of the world, Francis will turn around. This is a radical critique of the value system of the world. Call it a prophetic mode of, uh, of abandoning uh, the, the, the idols of the world in favor of some kind of uh, utopia or unexpected or uh, uh, really uh, not clarified, not very well described uh, uh, um, vision of how the world ought to be. But this is, he rejects all of this. So she bereft of her first husband, Coram Patri, he was joined to her and thenceforth loved her better every day. She bereft of her first husband, despised and obscure 1100 years hundred years and more remained without a suitor till he came. Nor did avail when men heard that he who put all the world in fear found her unmoved with amiclas at the sound of his voice. Nor did avail her to have such courage and constancy that while Mary stayed below, she, poverty, mounted on the cross with Christ. Even she does something even better than what Mary does. But le lest I proceed too darkly, take no Francis and poverty for these lovers in all I have said. Their harmony and happy looks. Look, this is another parody of uh, the language of, of, the, of the amorous discourse of medieval, uh, medieval love poetry. Uh, uh, they go on, he just, uh, he's, he's, uh, it's a dalliance with nothing. So they have now finally an inclusion of an extraordinary known value, because that's what poverty is, something that questions all values, and it's, it's, it's a Franciscan idea of poverty. What do they mean by that? What did Francis mean by this, by this idea of poverty? What is this poverty? First of all, you know that this subject became part of uh, an extensive uh, uh, iconographic representation, and one can think of uh, uh, the Giotto frescoes, the cycles, the Franciscan cycles in Assisi, but um, but all over Tuscany and, 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 and Umbria, uh, Umbria, by the way. So it's uh, it's not a, a unique and uh, uh, to Dante, to Dante's understanding and Dante's insight, this sort of representation and fascination with Francis. Another little detail that I should tell you is that Francis, in Italian, is Franciscus, meaning that he's French, and there was the, uh, like Francesca, uh, the other Francesca, the other one who also understood a lot about love, but lost her way uh, in, in, in Canto V. It really means free. The word, in English, we have the word frank, which in many ways carries over the resonance of the Latin word Franciscus. Francis, true to his name, is now, as being poor, absolutely free. There's no bondage to anything. There's nothing that holds him to anything in the world. 
So this is one important, uh, let's call it ethical extension of poverty. But what did they mean? What did the other Franciscans, like Bonaventure, who is there listening to what Aquinas may say about, about the founder of his order, what did they understand by that? Because whenever we talk about, and Dante certainly seems to stress the idea of poverty being poverty in a very material, bodily way, corporeal, physical. In the sense I call it prophetic, in the sense that, as you know, what distinguishes the, the, the biblical prophets from other prophets is that they usually choose to bear on their flesh the signs that they utter against the world. If they want to speak about the, 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 say, the infidelity of, uh, of Israel, they would marry a prostitute. If they want to denounce the uh, dissidents, heresies, and lacerations within the, the body politic of Israel, they would even go on cutting off an arm of theirs to, to dramatize on their flesh this idea of uh, uh, these prophetic uh, pronouncements that we're making. This is part of uh, what Francis then is doing here, and this idea that he's living uh, poverty. It's not just an allegory, it's an allegorical representation. It is something lived in the flesh. The literal and the allegorical are now compressed. But there's more. What, did, what, is, what, what does, for instance, uh, Bonaventure think of what poverty is? Dante, I repeat, thinks about the material idea of poverty, so a way of opposing avarice, uh, a way of opposing uh, uh, prodigality, attachment or contempt for the, the, the values. We have seen that, all of that before. But poverty to them also means poverty of language. France is the first one to, to have articulated even that poem of his, repetitive, the same simple formulaic uh, expressions, praised be uh, omnipotent, etc., Lord, etc., uh, repeated. The, it's a poverty of language, the poverty of our thoughts, that which Dante at the beginning of Canto 11 has been calling the defective. Remember, that is the, the word that I, I, I did not stress when we were uh, uh, all um, insensate care of mortals, how uh, vain our reasonings. No, 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 how defective. The, the, the Italian original says how defective. I hope some translators pick up defective and make it uh, and say that it's defe defective in the idea that they are lacking, that they, they have nothing of their own. So that retrospectively you can understand what I'm talking about, that we cannot own the world, that this is a that uh, the world is a world of gifts, uh, that, uh, that uh, the economy is an economy of giving, uh, constant giving, because the more you give and the less you have of yourself, the more you are free and the more productive your own uh, acts can become, as were the case of uh, Francis. But this is not all that Dante will do with a Francis. This is now, um, um, there is one uh, little reference that I want to mention. This is around lines uh, 102 um, or so. Uh, Francis uh, will go on uh, trying to have this, uh, um, to receive a seal of approval from the popes about the uh, fraternity, the order, the confraternity, whatever that he organized when the company of poor brothers increased behind him whose wondrous life were better sung in heaven's glory, the holy purpose of this chief shepherd was encircled with a second crown by the eternal spirit through Honorius. Honorius agrees, the Pope Honorius agrees to, to recognize this new order. And now listen to this. That's really the point that I, that I want to stop on for a while. And when in thirst for martyrdom he had preached Christ and them that followed him in the proud presence of the Sultan, and finding the people unripe for conversion and not being willing to remain for, so, for no purpose, he had returned to the harvest of the Italian fields there on the rough crag between Tiber and Arno. He received from Christ the last seal which his members bore for two years. He's alluding to the famous story of the stigmata that Francis received. This, the body becomes a sign. 
uh, what I was, I was trying to explain with the reference to the Hebrew prophets who uh, dramatize their, the, and, and, and legitimize the validity of their message by an inscription of that message on the literal, um, the physicality of their own flesh. And they tried to leave it that. But the point, though, uh, that Dante is making here, this is the story of the stigmata, but it's also the story of Francis who tries to go and preach to the Sultan. He fails. Uh, they have a, a theological argument, uh, and the two, the Sultan and uh, Francis, depart um, uh, each uh, on, along his way, for, on his way, uh, and, and that's it. But it's a story of, that can be understood apparently as a failure of Francis' message. You, but at the same time, it is an extraordinary hermeneutical turn that has taken place in Dante's thinking. We have had, and we will have, uh, celebrations of the Crusades. Now we have a story of an encounter between Christians and Muslims in terms of peaceful language, peaceful speech, where the two exponents or two of the exponents of the particular beliefs can come together and encounter and they can discuss. The Sultan says, no, um, for him you are not ripe. And for the Sultan probably says, well, I don't think you know what you're talking about. And, uh, and, they, and they leave. Okay, so this is an extraordinary change in uh, the uh, dissemination, in the dissemination of violence that had been at the center of so much theological discourse. And here Dante seems to be uh, opting and following Francis on a different route. This is, I think, an important change in, uh, in the consciousness, in the historic understanding of the relations between Christians and Muslims and their interpretations of the Crusades. But there is a further detail that I want to mention here. Um, uh, the, the detail is this detail about uh, two geographic coordinates in this canto. Now we have just read about Francis' trip to Egypt and the Sultan, right? A little earlier, Dante gives the, uh, ref refers to the birthplace of uh, Francis by talking about the Ganges, okay? So in other words, Dante has, is aware that there is a European world that we talked about last time, but there are two other, two other coordinates. One, a Hindu world of the Ganges, and we shall see what that means for him, and the other one is the Muslim world of the Sultan. He is acknowledging in many ways that which is, it's, we probably may not be entirely familiar with this, uh, this problem. He's acknowledging that which uh, the, uh, someone like Bonaventure had been discussing in 1273. Bonaventure, the man that we shall see next in the next canto, traveled to Paris to give a number of lectures at the University of Paris. He will die a year later in 1274. And they are called uh, um, uh, conferences, a number of conferences, uh, uh, in which he just debates the question of the relationship between what he calls the, these three cultures, Hindu, the Christian, and the Muslim, and tries to see in what way they can be uh, harmonized. He connects, it's Bonaventure, connects the Hindu uh, religion with Joachism in the sense that the Joachim of the Third Age, not complicated at all. You remember that Joachim has this paradigm of history according to a tripartite structure, the age of the, of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The Third Age, which is his own age, the age when Bonaventure lives, when Dante lives, is the age of the Spirit implies the um, elimination of uh, all institutions. The idea that the spirit now is everywhere and there is no need for any hierarchy or any order. Bonaventure says this is exactly the world of uh, the Hindus who believe that God is everywhere. And then he goes on talking about, he, Bonaventure, talks about the Muslims for who, who, whose theology is a theology of uh, uh, a, an impassable distance 
between God, a tra transcendence that nothing can really bridge between a God who remains invisible and the world of every man here. Of course, for him, the mediation between the two is given by, the, by Christianity because in, with, with the idea of there is a transcendence and at the same time an immanence of God and the transcendence of God. Dante is, I think, echoing these texts and these problems in the canto of Francis. So he places Francis between the Ganges and Egypt and places him as the, the one who is uh, carving a new space, the space that he calls that of poverty, meaning freedom, meaning the will, meaning the way of love uh, as a way of coming to the knowledge of God. Um, then uh, um, I would like to move on to uh, very briefly to Canto 12, briefly not because uh, I am uh, not, uh, uh, I'm insensitive uh, to what, uh, what Dante will do with Dominic in Canto 12. We really uh, haven't got time, but I want to mention to you a number of things. Uh, how uh, the encounter with uh, Bonaventure uh, told, oh, I'm sorry, the encounter with, uh, with uh, the description of uh, Dominic told by, uh, by Bonaventure uh, r r really rewrites the previous canto. There in the previous canto of uh, Francis where the marriage, uh, parodic, uh, a kind of uh, a, um, uh, anarchic idea of uh, uh, the valuelessness of all the worldly values. Uh, here now we have a different wedding, a different marriage between uh, Dominic and faith between knowledge and theology, if you want to put it at a very uh, generic and general level. Uh, and here too, uh, there is the, uh, that, let me just go over with um, uh, lines and 45. In that part, that's uh, be the, the description of uh, the legend of Dominic, the life of Dominic. In that part where sweet Zephyr rises to open the new leaves in which Europe, once again, see how Dante's, uh, there's a kind of continental uh, imagination here, the, the Asia, Africa, and, uh, and Europe, the three continents, there in which Europe sees herself reclad, um, not far from the beating of the waves behind which the sun, after his long flight, sometimes hides himself from all men, lies favored Kalahora. Uh, you love this detail. I know that I, I can tell by the way the, 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 the eyes of some of you smile when I point this, this, uh, this thing. Dante is talking about uh, the birthplace of, uh, of, uh, of Dominic and places, the, which is what it was, in the uh, western part of uh, Spain, there where the sun sets. Okay? So that Dominic becomes the counter to Francis. He was born where the sun rises and now uh, Dominic is within the, where the sun sets, okay? So between the two of them, the whole movement of the sun, the translatio, the translation of faith, not the translation of empires, not the translation of culture, the translation of faith seems to be encompassed between the two of them. But that which will make you smile is that Dante mentioned, uh, and you can check, Francis' birth in the east where the sun rises, a line 50 of Canto 11, and he mentions the, sun, the setting sun of Dominic in line 52 of uh, Canto 12. It's as if uh, there is a kind of, uh, the, the, this, is, this is a kind of little touch. I think it's, uh, it's I find it a very amusing touch between them. So uh, uh, to, to account for the, 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 the difference in proximity between the two, as if this movement also has a kind of, uh, the movement of the sun from east to west, on account of them, has its own uh, uh, quickness, its own rhythm. Um, okay, um, and then in it was born the loving liegeman of the Christian faith, the holy athlete, gracious to his own and pitiless to enemies. And he is, in his mind, as soon as it was created, was so full of living power that his mother's womb it made her prophetic. When the espousal between him and faith were completed at the holy font, here there is another marriage ceremony that counters the previous marriage ceremony of Canto, of Canto 11. But I want to draw your attention to the use of these playful images, the athlete the, of 
of faith, the liegeman. In the previous canto, we had a Francis who I said parodies all the values of the world. He is called, and that, that has really become uh, a formula to describe both Francis and less Dominic though. They are the so-called, I give it to you in Latin and translate it in, in English, it's, we would call them the clowns of the Lord, the oculatores. They are the clowns, the oculatores domini. Uh, 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 the clowns of the Lord. That is to say, they are playing. They are playing at the world. They play with the world. They bring in a, what we could call a perspective of play in the world. They are making fun of the world. They are challenging the values of the world. And in this sense, they bring out that which becomes the most impressive aspect of their theology, which is that of a playful theology. We'll talk more about this. The notion that God plays, that creation itself is a spectacle. I call it a theodrama. The idea that God, it's not, it's, it, doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't deprive the divinity of its seriousness, but makes that seriousness part of a world of joy. That's the, that's the whole, the aesthetics, the new aesthetics that uh, Francis manages to release and Dominic manages also to release this kind of playful idea of the world, a comedy. I, I tried to explain to you from the very first day when we got together how complicated it was for me at the time to explain why Dante calls his text a comedy, because it's so sublime. It seems to be, he's talking about how the ordinary, a plain man of the year, around the year 1300, manages to have the most sublime of experiences. And I said, yes, of course, this is about the happy ending, because comedies are always the genre of happy ending. It is about the, the low level of experience. It's about the vulgar language that Dante uses. But the real and substantial reason for uh, Dante calling his poem a comedy, and for the readers, uh, using the attribute of divine was exact, is exactly that, a way of responding to this uh, uh, sense of uh, the joyful quality of creation. That's, that's the point. So for all the serious, for all the horror that we have been witnessing through hell and purgatory, joy seems to be that with toward which Dante is moving. Not a tragic vision, because once you play of, once you think of play, you can no longer have the tragic vision, because you understand that the tragic vision is part of something larger. It is, it is, it is part, it's a vicissitude, you know, the comedies and tragedies, elegies are all linked to the wheel of fortune in medieval iconography. So you keep going around, but they're all part of something really larger, which is this playful uh, theology, this theologia ludens. Uh, that uh, that he has been encompassing, uh, that he has been uh, preparing for us. Let me just go on with uh, a few more, uh, uh, the, the, uh, a, f a few more uh, details here, a couple of minutes, and then uh, uh, th this relationship now of uh, um, uh, the 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 other issue that uh, really uh, and retrospectively. Another issue that Dante is raising, let me just uh, t talk about this, uh, in the canto of Dominic, much more than he did in the canto of Francis. This is a really unique moment. It is a representation in terms of language. It is as if whatever orthodoxy Dominic stands for, because that's why what the Dominicans, the Dominicans were the intellectual arm of the church. They were, as I said, founded with a specific purpose of entering the universities and debating uh, the various points of view. They were the Aristotelians, they were the poets, they were traditionally the troublemakers, of, of they were the, 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 uh, the figures, the, the philosophers and so on, uh, in, especially in Paris, that's the, 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 the university. Uh, so there, was a, there is a, an idea of orthodoxy with Dominic, and yet here the whole representation takes place in, ter it takes, takes place in terms of language. Let me give you a couple of example, examples uh, around lines 80. Many a time his nurse found him silent, and awake on the ground. This is part of this uh, laudatio, this encomium now of, uh, of, of Dominic, as if he said, for this am I come. O father 
of him, Felice, Felix, indeed, or mother of him, Giovanna, indeed, if interpreted, it means what they say. Dante is playing with etymologies here. Oh, the father is really happy. There is a relationship between the name and his state of mind. And the mother is meaning uh, the one who is full of grace. Giovanna, the one who comes before, um, uh, is also, if you interpret it properly. That is to say, orthodoxy or heresy, being its, its, its flip side, right? Heresy and orthodoxy. We've been talking about uh, Sigur of Fra uh, Brabant's heresy. We've been talking about Joachim's whole heresy. Here appears as a question of language, as a question of uh, an order that is above all a grammatical order. And therefore, it needs a kind of correction or has a kind of ambiguity that you always assume and you always presume to be present within the order of language. Anything. In fact, retrospectively, I can say to you that even the schisms of Inferno, where we saw the poet Bertrand de Born, you remember that horrifying picture of uh, the poet who holds in his own hand like a lamp his own head and goes on talking to the, the Virgil and, and Dante. Or in that same canto, there was the, the presence of Mohammed, uh, whose body seemed to be completely lacerated, even the schisms are questions of language, are questions Dante understands them as issues of language, which doesn't, don't, which only means this, uh, to talk about language, I repeat, they are part of the imponderable quality of language, the ambiguities of language, the force of language, and the power of language, okay? So that's, uh, that's what I can tell you about these cantos. And let me stop here and uh, see if, uh, um, there are questions that I would most gladly uh, hear, if not answer, but... Uh, uh. Please. Um, would Dante have faced any uh, threat from the church for placing uh, Joachim in uh, paradise? In his uh, the question is, uh, uh, would Dante have uh, uh, faced some uh, censorship, probably, uh, from, uh, from the church authorities for placing Joachim uh, in paradise. Actually, no, not at all, because the formula he uses, uh, here comes the Calabrian abbot Joachim, endowed with the gift of prophecy, more or less, that's the, the translation. It translates a Latin formula, the spiritu prophetico totato, which was would already used. He had been, Joachim had already been exempted of uh, the censure of his thought that uh, Bonaventure had voiced. And in, uh, in the Mass, in honor of Joachim, they would use that formula. So he's actually using a canonical <coughs> uh, formula, church formula, uh, for his own, uh, for Joachim's own. Uh, uh, never happened, he's not a saint, never was a saint, but what Dante probably, oh, that's what he did, it's, he should be canonized. Uh, okay, no, but the answer is, uh, and that's the reason why um, he could not have faced any, um, any reprimands. Yes? Um, the, good que the, the question is, I, I was talking about poverty as being a state of freedom um, um, uh, in the Kent of Francis. Uh, would, are we supposed to also uh, associate Dante's own fate of poor exile, beggar that he was during his exile uh, in that description? That's, that's the question. And I would say, yes, of course. The, uh, poverty, I hope I explained, means several things 
for, for Dante. Bonaventure, we go on thinking about poverty of language, poverty of philosophy, uh, etc. But all of them understand poverty in a very literal way, but all of them understand one thing, that this kind of poverty is really a description of the human condition to begin with. We are all poor. That's the primary sense. We are all born uh, defective and in need, whatever needs we have. Some of us go on being needy, or, and we are, all our lives. Right? So this is a, a general understanding of the idea of poverty. But then there is a sort of uh, the other side of this. And the other side is that it's actually a blessing because it's the state of freedom. It, this is really very much like what you expect to the philosophical, philosophical freedom, you know, without any cares, even horrors. I don't want to have wealth and, and start worrying about having the cares about how the stock market is doing today or not doing. Um, so I want to be completely free of that, and it's a state of freedom. Is Dante also thinking about himself? Does it have a consolatory note for him to believe that, after all, I'm not alone? Yes, yes, I would say uh, that that's, that's the case. In his own life, Dante, unlike Petrarch, who really died, the poet who follows a few years after Dante, he really died one of the wealthiest men of his time by virtue of being a poet, a writer, and so on. Dante never g got to that point. Well, I mean, I'm wondering if we should take it literally, his sort of feelings about poverty, or is it more like a, an idyllic, a sort of poetic escape into uh, a perspective, I guess, that he adopts, like adopting the perspective of mm -hmm. poverty? Should we take it literally or, is, or just as a poetic um, way of speaking? Uh, I think that I answer that by saying, but I think you're asking something else, maybe, and then I'll get to that. Since you are the, uh, I think I'm, ask, I'm saying that this is, was really the reality of his life. A, a, a stance such as that is bound to appear maybe, well, you know, you need a little bit of comfort and consolation, and so you say it's a poverty, but it's, it's, it really has the chrism of uh, Francis' spirituality. But I'm not trying to diminish Dante's convictions. What I think you're really asking is, I don't know if you're really asking, I don't know, uh, but uh, I know what you were asking, but I, there is another side to your question. Are you asking me whether or not he was a Franciscan, for instance? Is that what you're asking? Because if you are, that would be a very good question, in the sense that there were a lot of uh, ideas, we don't have any evidence, but a lot of ideas that he became a member of the third order of the Franciscans, a lay order of the Franciscans, so that he practiced, therefore, truly, literally in his own life, that which Francis himself had uh, uh, practiced and preached. So maybe that's what probably, if you weren't asking that, maybe you should have been asking that, and that would have been, I would have been saying that. Other questions or we have a few minutes on. Yes. Does the story of the Pope and the Angel Sand is supposed to provide our um, view of Dante in or Dante's view of the um, of Islam, the integrate and being better and uh, that's a very good question. It's the view of, uh, of Francis going to the Sultan, uh, supposed, is it meant to revise uh, the view that we may have uh, uh, formed of Dante's attitude toward Islam reading Infer Inferno 28? Um, uh, I think so. I think so. I think my answer is that I, I, that's why I was stressing this, that there is a sort of uh, uh, a radical turning that takes place in uh, Francis operates a change in the way the Christians and the Muslims can go on uh, uh, thinking of that encounter. It's no longer through armies, it is through peaceful uh, discourse. From this point of view, Francis uh, uh, carries on a tradition that had started with uh, Peter the Venerable, uh, there were a few other theologians who had a kind of view that it was not through, through wars that this uh, kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, dialogue 
um, could take place if uh, war is a form of dialogue, I'm not sure, of course. The, uh, so Dante acknowledges that in Francis. And I think that he dramatizes it, he, just as he dr is dramatizing the sense of the, uh, the awareness, which was very central to Bonaventure, of uh, the relationship of the three, to him, the three religions, the, the Hindus, the Christians, and, and the Muslims. Um, and and uh, retrospectively, it forced me to now say things about schism that I did not say when we, we were reading Canto 28, that schism, we have a presence there of, uh, you remember, uh, all forms of schism, we have a religious schism uh, uh, with uh, a friar uh, who decides, who is really a joachist, by the way, uh, Dolcino. There was uh, the poet who, by the power of his words, uh, Bertrand de Bourne, the Provencal poet, divides father from son, the king, the king from the son, and therefore breaks the unity of the body politic. The idea that, you know, the king's two bodies in the famous formula of the book of the great historian, Kantarovics, right? So that he broke that kind of unity. There is then an allusion to a story from Lucan, uh, one of the soldiers, Curio, who uh, broke away from, uh, from Pompey and he had, from Caesar, and he had his own tongue cut off. It's clear that schism is to be understood linguistically. I am, I'm, I am not revising my view, but now I can tell you what I always thought was uh, underlying the representation of even uh, Islam, which means that even the interpretation of Muhammad in 28, horrifying though it, as, 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 as it is, it, it really appears as if Muhammad was the one who was doubling the existing unity. No, that's it, that's it, through the power of speech. That's, that's the view, it's a horrifying representation that does not take anything away from that. But clearly you see that the Dante's understanding of these issues is a little bit more nuanced than it may at first sight, at first sight appear. When we come later in uh, the heaven of justice, and before we get to heaven of justice, Dante go goes on talking about the warriors. And he begins with Joshua, the, 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 the hero who brings about the destruction of uh, Jericho, uh, etc. And then but he also mentions the Crusaders. Uh, so there is a kind of uh, ambiguity that I would say that he, he still values what he thinks is the heroic life. Nonetheless, after I say this, let me just state another point about Dante. That's true that clearly he's talking from a Christian standpoint. There's no question about this. But the underlying spirituality of Dante is what I call the spirituality of the desert. Dante is truly the poet of the desert, in the sense that in the desert you have modes of a quest that where everyone is really going, because wherever we are going, we are always going to the absolute. Whatever journey we may take, it's always the same journey. And so the spirituality of the quest sort of, I, I, I wouldn't say overhauls, but at least tempers this idea of Dante being so strict and, and firm in uh, this universe of degrees and distinctions that he sets up. I don't know if I clarified this for you, okay? Thank you so much.